Good afternoon. Uh, this video is going to be about ancient China. So I'm going to start out with some geography. And this is the borders of modern day China, but uh, ancient China is going to occupy much the same space. There are going to be two rivers that are important in ancient China. One is the Yangtze River, the other is the Yellow River. And the Yellow River is going to be considered the, the cradle if you will, that's where it really is going to get started. And the soil around the Yellow River is very special. It's called Los Soil. Uh, it's a special uh, geography and geology term. And really what it means is it's just very loose soil that's been picked up from the desert that's further west and in Mongolia. And it's blown to the river valley where it becomes very fertile. Because it's very uh, light, I guess I'll say, uh, it's soil that's easily blown around. Uh, it causes the Yellow River to change course very easily, and the Yellow River is also very prone to flooding. You also have grasslands that are known as steeps. You've got desert, you've got mountain, you've got the ocean, you've got plains, you've got jungle. Really, the geography of China has just about every formation you can think about. When we talk about Chinese civilization, we do it in the form of dynasties. And the first dynasty is the Shia dynasty. This one is not confirmed. It's a mythical or semi-mythical dynasty. It's mentioned in ancient Chinese history books, but the people who come right after them do not mention them, which is why we think they're somewhat mythical. The first dynasty that we know for sure exists is the Shang. And We've located their capital city. We've done excavations there, so we know a little bit about them. Uh, we know that they were a, a group of warrior horsemen. They had a king. The king was all-powerful, but not a god. Their cities were made out of wood, which made them easy to rebuild or move if needed. We know the king was very wealthy. The king had lots of servants and lots of soldiers to protect him. And then we know that they had some sort of creator god, a deity above, and then they believed in something called ancestor worship, which basically meant that they pray to uh, their past ancestors to put in a good word with them, with their deity. After the Shang, we have a group known as the Shu, and we, the Shu is broken into the Eastern Shu and the Western Shu. The Western Shu came first, and the Shu are going to invade from the West. They're going to invade Shang, China, and they're going to kill the last Shang king. The most important thing to know about the Western Shu is the development of feudalism. And Chinese feudalism, it's really similar to what European feudalism is. You got the king at the top. The king is going to give land to people. Those people that he gives land to are known as vassals. The king is going to be the lord of the land. Those vassals are typically going to be nobles, and then they can give their land away to others as well. So you get this whole system that starts at the top and works its way down. The biggest difference between European and Chinese feudalism is where the merchants are. In European feudalism, the merchants come under the nobles, but in Chinese feudalism, the peasants come under the nobles, and then the merchants are at the very bottom. So the king is going to give land, usually to somebody who has given them favor or created something or done a good deed for the king. The king is the lord of the land. The vassal is the one who the land is given to. Because the king gives land to the vassals, the vassals are in exchange going to give allegiance and money and agree to defend the king as well. Another item that comes from the Western Shoe is the idea of the Mandate of Heaven. And this is a complex system that the Chinese worked out where the king receives his power from heaven. And the king, as a result of getting power from heaven, is supposed to act and be moral, be a good moral person. If the king is not moral and does not do the best for their people, then the mandate is lost and they could be replaced. So if a group of people think that the king is not doing right, they could claim that the king has lost the mandate of heaven and then overthrow them. And that's what happens with the Eastern Shu. Uh, over time, feudalism is going to lead the Shu kings to give away so much land that they're no longer the most powerful and they're not the most wealthy anymore. 
And so the vassals of the Shu king start to turn on them, and there's this big, long civil war that lasts many, many years. You can break the civil war period, or the Eastern Shu dynasty, into two parts, really. You've got the spring and autumn session, and then you got the warring states session. During the spring and autumn session, that's where feudalism breaks down, and some of these vassals start to challenge the king. And the king is going to be forced to move further and further east um, periodically. Eventually, by 481, uh, the feudalism system completely breaks down, and then there's just open rebellion against the Shu kings. There are several dozen states that develop, and they all fight each other. And by the year 256, there's going to be one state that survives, and that new state will claim the throne of ancient China. And that's where we get the Xin dynasty from. The Xin, uh, led by a guy named Xin Shi Huang Ti, is going to be the winner of that civil war. They are from the most far western part of China. They used horse in their, their fighting. Uh, they are distantly related to the Mongols and the Huns, from what I understand. And the Xin dynasty, Xin Shi Huang Ti, is going to end that idea of feudalism. He's not going to give any land away, he's going to start a policy called legalism. And the easiest way to understand legalism is that all must serve the state. All the laws are going to apply equally, all the laws are going to apply impartially, and instead of giving jobs away, uh, there's going to be a test, a civil service test you have to take to work in the government. And because of that, the idea of education and going to school is going to become very important in Chinese society. This is really going to be a period of unification as well. The weights are standardized, the measurements are standardized, the language is standardized. Even the size of the road is going to be standardized by the Xin dynasty. Uh, Xin Shi Huang Ti has also got a dark side. He was a megalomaniac who thought he was, should have been in charge of everything. He was also very skeptical and thought people were out to get him. And very often he would take lords who opposed him uh, topple them, kill them, and then put a, a uh, person who looks like him into the castle of the person he just took over. Another thing that uh, Xin Shi Wang Ti does is he builds this clay, this clay army known as the Terracotta Army. And I'm not going to play the video, but uh, what you have here, these are soldiers that are made out of clay. And at one point in time, they were also painted. And this clay army was supposed to protect Xin Shi Wang Ti in death. After the Xin dynasty, we have the Han dynasty. After Xin Shi Wang Ti dies, there is a brief civil war, and a guy named Lu Peng is going to become the next emperor. And it's going to give creation to the Han dynasty. Now, the Han dynasty is going to see the largest period of Chinese expansion in Chinese history. The borders are going to go basically to what they are today. Um, they go to Vietnam, to Korea, all the way into Central Asia. The Han Dynasty is going to establish the Silk Road, which becomes one of the primary trading routes between China and Europe. And then Buddhism is going to leave India and come to China during this time period as well. Now, even though Buddhism is going to be one of the dominant religions, it's not the official religion. Uh, Confucianism is going to be the, the official government religion slash philosophy. And speaking of philosophies, there are three philosophies that you should look at. Um, first philosophy is Buddhism. And Buddhism is actually founded by uh, Prince Siddhartha Gautama, who it later becomes known as the Buddha. Uh, Siddhartha Gautama is actually from Nepal. He's not from India or China. Uh, Nepal is a country that exists between the two. It's up in the mountains in the Himalayas. And Swadartha Gautama, uh, he never really needed or wanted anything his entire life because he was a prince. He lived inside the palace at all times. But when he came of age, he leaves the palace. And for the first time, he realizes that not everybody lived the life that he lived. And <clears throat> being a devout Hindu, uh, he's going to sit and meditate and try to find a way to reach moksha. And he comes up with this idea of four noble truths. He says, everybody is suffering. There's a cause to that suffering. And there's a way to end that suffering. And the way to end that suffering is known as the Eightfold Path. 
Now, what is the Eightfold Path? He says that you have to have right understanding. You need to understand why you're in the situation you're in. You have to have right thought. You have to re remain positive in your thoughts and know that you can overcome whatever your suffering is. Right speech. You have to say the right things and not go out of your way to hurt people. Uh, right conduct. You have to personally act right and personally act um, you know, gentle and kind. Uh, right means, mean, uh, that means to live financially in a way that you can. Right attitude uh, is to be positive. Right determination is to persevere and not give up. And the right concentration is often considered to be meditation. So if you do those eight things according to Prince Siddhartha Gautama, you will reach moksha. Your soul will be released from the cycle of samsara. Then we have Confucius. Uh, Confucius was actually a teacher, and all of his teachings and sayings are collected in a book called The Analects. And Confucius is going to uh, base his ideas, his philosophy, around the idea of morality and operating correctly in your relationships with others. And that means that you have, know if, you have to know your relationship with your family members, with your elders, with your ancestors, with the government. And very famously, Confucius says, a good man creates good government. This will become the primary and the preferred way of belief by the Chinese government. And it's because it is going to convince and drive the people to do what the government wants. Uh, the emperor is seen as the father of the land. And if the emperor says to do something because you're supposed to respect your elders and your, your superiors, you're expected to do it. Now, what if you're just an everyday person who's not gonna have a lot of money and doesn't have a lot of say in things? You're probably going to be a believer in Taoism. Uh, Taoism is founded by a philosopher named Lao Tzu, and all of his teachings are found in something called the Tao Te Ching. This is better known as uh, the duality or the, um, the yin and the yang, if you will. And it's all about balance and inner peace. Uh, some very famous sayings of the Tao Te Ching, uh, let go of pride and admit you can be wrong, don't be afraid of change, and live with peace with oneself. In other words, find the lightness in the dark and find the darkness in the light. It's all about balance and going with the flow. And because it's all about going with the flow and finding a balance, uh, this is going to be what the lower class, the farmers, and the peasants believe in because they don't have much control over what happens to them in their lives. Now, there's one other religion that's going to be involved here, and that is Jainism. Jainism is kind of like a middle ground between Hinduism and Buddhism. And Mahavira is going to be their version of Buddha. Uh, Mahavira lives in a royal palace. He doesn't want anything as he's growing up. When he grows up, he realizes that the world is full of suffering. And he gives up all of his worldly possessions and goes and meditates much like Buddhist or Buddha did. Uh, Mahavira, though, is going to attain moksha and nirvana after a long period of, I believe it was 22 years of fasting and meditating. These are the basic beliefs of Jainism. Um, it's about reincarnation. It's about proper conduct and proper relationships. Uh, it is about avoiding all violence, no matter how big or small. And then the, there's no absolutes. Everybody's perspective has merit. No perspective is wrong. This is a religion that is very, very open-minded. What are the practices? Uh, if you're a devout Jain, you're going to carry a broom in front of you or with you that you sweep the ground in front of you with, and that's to get any bugs out of the way so you don't hurt any bugs. If you're a devout Jain nun or a Jain monk, you don't accept food that's cooked by others because you can't guarantee that something wasn't hurt in the making of your food. Uh, they either wear simple white clothes or they wear nothing at all. Uh, water has to be filtered before use. And then uh, they are not named at birth. They are named after they're born. And there's a list of names that are approved. So only certain names can be given to people who believe in Jainism. 
they're a fairly small religion. You don't find many people who follow Jainism, but it is an important religion nonetheless. All right, we're at the 15 minute mark. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, just send me an email and I will be happy to answer them. Hope you have a great day.